Warning the following video contains content that may be disturbing for some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey guys I'm Panash Black and once again welcome to my little crime channel in the heart of Wales. Here are 12 missing children cases with surrounding circumstances that gave the world the creeps and remain unsolved to this day. So with all that said let's begin. Number 1 Sarah Kinslow. First on this list of missing children cases is that of Sarah Kinslow. It was 2001 when tragedy struck the Kinslow family. In May, 14-year-old Sarah Kinslow was dropped off at her school in Texas. Little did her family know, it would be the last time they'd see her. According to her friends, they and Sarah were planning to skip school that day, but their plans never pushed through, as they did not see Sarah either. It was later found that at the time of her disappearance, Sarah was in a relationship with a man four years her senior, who was arrested a week after Sarah vanished. And charged with sexual assault of a child. He then told the police that he and Sarah thought about eloping, although he asserted they were never serious about it. Although it was clear that Sarah didn't take with her her purse and any set of clothes when she left, the circumstances of the case led the police to believe that the teen ran on her own. It's been over 17 years since the girl disappeared, but until now, nobody could tell what exactly happened to Sarah Kinslow. Number 2 Cherry Mayen Leroy McKinney often drove Little Cherry the 50 yards from the school bus stop and Willfield Roads to their mobile home, but on February 22, 1985, he and his wife, Janice, decided to have the 8-year-old walk home, a decision they'd forever regret. Last seen wearing a grey coat, blue denim skirt, blue leg warmers, ankle boots, and earmuffs due to the cold weather, at around 4pm and just a short walk away from their house. Cherry went missing. It was a snowy day but no footprints were seen on the way leading to the McKinney's home, prompting the police to believe Cherry was abducted shortly after she got off the school bus. Leroy shared that he heard the bus pull up and leave that day when he noticed that Cherry still wasn't home. A few minutes after the bus left, he drove to the stop. But he did not see her stepdaughter there, so he rushed back home, and Janice called the police. There was little to no clue on how the girl disappeared, except for a unique-looking van. Interviews with neighbors and children on board the bus helped the police determine that the van was a bright blue or green 1976 Dodge, which had been following the bus. It had an unusual mural painting of a skier scaling down a snow-capped mountain. One of the most talked about missing children cases, disappearance of Cherry Mayen remains unsolved. No arrests have been made and the schoolgirl is still nowhere to be found. Number 3 RG Desir Six-year-old RG Desir was just playing outside his grandmother's house when he strangely disappeared. RG was with other kids that day, and he came in to eat dinner but went back out again to play. His grandmother checked on him from time to time. Fifteen minutes after she last saw the boy from the window, RG's grandma took a peek again, but the young boy was gone. What worries RG's family more is the fact that the boy has developmental issues. He is six but has the mind of a two-year-old. He easily gets scared and hides when he's afraid. The sight of strangers scares RG too, prompting him to believe that he might have hid from searchers. It was January 2009 when RG Desir disappeared, but until now, his family is still hoping the boy will come back to them safe and sound. Number 4 Timothy Pitson May 11, 2011, was the date. James drove Timothy to kindergarten early in the morning. The six-year-old hopped out of his dad's car. James said his, I love you, to which Timothy replied with, I love you too, dad. The kid ran off to school. Sadly, that would be James's last memory of his son. Things started to take a strange turn when Timothy's mom, Amy Pitson, picked up the boy from school before classes ended. Telling his teacher there was family emergency. The two made a trip to the zoo and two different water parks. James came to pick up his son later, only to be told he was fetched by his mother. Three days later, Amy was found dead in a motel room of apparent suicide. Timothy, however, was nowhere to be found. 
James shared that Amy had been struggling with depression, but he believed she would never hurt her own son. A suicide note was found, believed to be written by Amy, which stated that Timothy was safe with people who would love and care for him, but ended with the chilling sentence, you will never find him. Although left with almost no clue as to where his son is, James is hoping he's actually safe somewhere, as Amy's note says. Number 5 Stephen Stainer Stephen Gregory Stainer, April 18, 1965 to September 16, 1989, was an American kidnap victim. Stainer was abducted from the central California city and county of Merced, at the age of seven, and held until he was 14, when he escaped and rescued another victim, Timothy White, in 1980. Stainer died in 1989 in a motorcycle accident while driving home from work. On the afternoon of December 4, 1972, Stephen Stainer was approached on his way home from school by a man named Irvin Edward Murphy, an acquaintance of Kenneth Parnell. Murphy described by those who knew him as a trusting, naive and simple-minded man, had been enlisted by convicted child rapist Parnell, who had passed himself off as an aspiring minister to Murphy, into helping him abduct a young boy so that Parnell could raise him in a religious-type deal, as Murphy later stated. For years Parnell abused Stephen and told him that he had legally adopted him. As Stephen entered puberty, Parnell began to look for a younger child to kidnap. On February 14, 1980, Parnell and a teenage friend of Stevens, named Sean Pullman, kidnapped five-year-old Timmy White. In Ukiah, California, motivated in part by the young boy's distress, Stephen decided to escape with him, intending to return the boy to his parents and then escape himself. The two boys were picked up by the police and Stephen told them the whole story. Stephen's life was the basis of the 1989 miniseries, I Know My First Name Is Stephen. Number 6 Lisa Irwin Lisa Irwin was not even a year old when she disappeared. Her mom, Deborah Bradley, tucked her into bed one night in 2011. The mother then went to have a few drinks. When Lisa's father, Jeremy, got home from work at 3 a.m., he noticed his daughter was not in her crib. It was believed Deborah had too much to drink that she blacked out. Also missing were a few working cell phones. It was only to be expected that Deborah had to face suspicions, as she was the only one present at the time of the disappearance. However, she has always maintained her innocence, and she and Jeremy are still hoping Lisa will come back to them alive seven years after she strangely vanished. Number 7 Kyron Horman Born on September 9, 2002, Kyron Horman was only seven when he disappeared without trace. On June 4, 2010, Skyline Elementary in Oregon opened early to give students and parents enough time to tour the science fair happening that day, an event Chiron was to take part in. Shortly after 8, he arrived at school with his stepmom, Terry Moulton Horman. Thirty minutes later, she left after watching her stepson walk to his classroom. Nine in the morning was the very last time Chiron was spotted, by a student near the south entrance of Skyline School. Classes began at 10 and Chiron's homeroom teacher had to report him absent, as he was nowhere to be seen. Eight years later, Chiron remains missing. Suspicions were on his stepmother who has since maintained she has nothing to do with the disappearance of the seven-year-old boy. Chiron's cases is one of the most popular missing children cases. And to this day, Chiron's parents, Desiree Young and Kane Horman, are still waiting for their son to come back despite the lack of leads on where the kid could have been. Number 8 Sabrina Eisenberg Probably one of the youngest subjects of missing children cases, Sabrina Eisenberg was only four months old when she was taken from her crib in November 1997. She was put down to sleep one night by her mother, she didn't know the minute she watched her doze off would be the last time she could ever lay her eyes on her daughter. Sabrina's mother, Marlene, told the police her baby was still there at midnight, but when she took a look again at 7 a.m., Sabrina was no longer in her crib. There were no witnesses, no sound was heard, no signs of forced entry were found. It's been two decades. Sabrina would have turned 21 this year, but despite efforts to find the missing kid, until now, nobody knows exactly where she is or where she has been or if she's still alive. Number 9 Fusako Sano 
Fusako Sano is a Japanese woman who was kidnapped at age 9 by Nobuyuki Sato, and held in captivity for 9 years and 2 months from November 13, 1990 to January 28, 2000. In Japan, the case is also known as the Niigata Girl Confinement Incident. Fusako Sano, then a 4th grade elementary school girl, disappeared on November 13, 1990, at age 9. After watching a school baseball game in her hometown of Sanjo, Niigata Prefecture, Japan, a huge police search failed to find the missing girl. Police even considered the possibility that she had been kidnapped by North Korean intelligence operatives. She had been kidnapped by Nobuyuki Sato, then a 28-year-old mentally disturbed unemployed Japanese man, who forced her into his car, and subsequently held her in the upstairs floor of his apartment in a residential area of Kashiwazaki. Niigata Prefecture, for nine years and two months. The house is only 200 meters from a Koban police substation, and 55 kilometers from the location where she was kidnapped. While Sano was initially scared, according to her own statements she eventually just gave up and accepted her fate. Allegedly, the kidnapper kept her tied up for several months, and used a stun gun for punishments if she did not videotape the horse racing on TV. Sano was also threatened with a knife and beaten. Her kidnapper shared his men's clothes with her and gave her food three times per day, either instant food or meals cooked by his mother, who lived downstairs in the apartment. He also cut Sano's hair. Since there was no bath or toilet upstairs where Sano was confined, she was only able to take a bath infrequently, when permitted by her captor. She spent most of her time in captivity listening to radio, and reportedly was allowed to watch TV only in the last year of her ordeal. While the door was never locked. Sano did not take a step outside for nine years. She later told the police, I was too scared to escape and eventually lost the energy to escape. The mother of Nobuyuki Sato, then 73 years old, consulted the Kashiwazaki Public Health Center in January 1996, because her son had been acting strangely and was violent to her. She called again on January 12, 2000, and again on January 19, requesting a visit to her home. Officials finally visited the home on Friday, January 28, 2000. Subsequently, Sato caused a disturbance that resulted in police being called to the scene. On this occasion, Sano, by then 19 years old, approached the officers and identified herself. Number 10 Eloise Warledge Eloise Warledge was 8 years old when she vanished from her own bedroom on January 12, 1976, in Beaumaris, Victoria, Australia. On that day, at 8.30 p.m., Eloise's mother Patsy left the house for her regular ballet class and left the children, Eloise, along with her brother and sister, with their father. Patsy returned home at 10.30 p.m. and went to see each of the children individually before retiring to bed herself, at 11 p.m. Lindsay had spent the night drinking in the house and watching television, the couple were currently going through a separation. He went to bed at 11.40 p.m., not realizing that the front door to the house had been left open. Patsy woke up at 7.30 a.m. to find the flywire in the window of her daughter's bedroom had been cut and the daughter was nowhere to be seen. In a panic, Patsy ran across the road to her neighbor's house while Lindsay called the police. The police later revealed that Lindsay's phone call seemed strangely unemotional. A team of 250 police officers searched for the missing child for three weeks but found nothing. Under further investigation it seemed that the flywire cut was not big enough for the child or an abductor to fit through, and so the most likely scenario was that Eloise had been removed through the front door. However, had the flywire cut been an intentional red herring caused by the perpetrator? In total, over 200 suspicious incidents were logged on the night that Eloise went missing. These ranged from noises in the neighboring area late at night, to sounds of a car door slamming and a crying child. The case was reopened more than 20 years after the events but no clues have yet been found to indicate what happened to Eloise Warledge. The father did agree on the day of her disappearance to take a lie detector test but this was not done until 25 years later. The results were inconclusive. Number 11 Megumi Yokota The story of Megumi Yokota is fascinating for several reasons. It begins with the disappearance of a young girl from Japan in 1977, and develops into a story of international espionage. 
It was a November day in 1977, when Sachi Yokota said goodbye to her daughter as she left for school and never returned. In the years following, both Sachi and her husband searched tirelessly for clues as to the whereabouts of their daughter, but uncovered absolutely nothing. A couple of years after the disappearance, Sachi and her husband Shigeru learned that Japanese residents had begun disappearing off the coast facing North Korea, and the Koreans were the prime suspects in the abductions. However, it took until 1997 for a North Korean defector to give the Yokotas the information they had been searching for. The defector stated that Megumi had, in fact, been taken by abductors working for the North Korean government, and taken across the seas to aid in the training of North Korean spies intent on being able to blend in with the Japanese culture. However, Megumi had been taken by mistake, her real age not being realized until she was already long gone. The story would seem like the work of someone with a very overactive imagination if it were not for the fact that North Korea admitted, in 2002, to the abduction of 12 Japanese citizens in the 1970s and 80s, Megumi being one of them. They stated that she had committed suicide at the age of 29, and returned what they said were her ashes to Japan, where DNA testing was claimed to prove the remains were not Megumi's. The missing girl would now be in her 40s and the Yokotas continue to search for the truth of what happened to their daughter, clinging on to the belief that she is still alive, somewhere. And last but not least number 12 Edward and Austin Bryant. Most missing children are reported as soon as they are thought to be missing by anguished parents. However, in 2011, authorities in Colorado were notified of the disappearance of Austin Bryant. Upon further investigation, they found that Austin had actually gone missing some time between 2003 and 2005 when he would have been between 5 and 7 years old. To make things worse, his brother had also gone missing in 2001, at the age of 9 but his disappearance had also gone unreported. Edward and Austin, biological siblings, were fostered, and later adopted, by Edward and Linda Bryant in 1999. The children had adopted nine children in total. And as Edward and Austin were considered to have special needs, $1,700 a month was awarded to the Bryants for their care. It was one of the other adoptees of the Bryants who came forward with information on the missing children in 2011, adding that they had been physically abused throughout the stay. The Bryants are currently awaiting trial for continuing to collect the money for the care of the children, but not in connection with their disappearance. Edward and Austin remain missing. The pain the parents of the children in these missing children, and murder victim cases have to live with is indescribable. They wake up every morning to the fact that one of the members of their family could have been there with them but isn't. But even after decades have passed, they remain hopeful that one day, their family will be complete again. So there we have it guys. If you would like to request a case for us to look at please click on the request a case form link in the description box below. Please like and subscribe, and leave a comment down below. Also hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of our future content. Guys it's been a pleasure once again I am Panash Black and thank you so much for watching until next time take care.